Stephen Chase is an assistant professor in the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition and the Department of Biomedical Engineering. He will be talking to us about motor control, motor learning, and brain-computer interfaces. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I want to talk to you today about the hardest thing you'll ever do. And contrary to popular belief, the hardest thing you'll ever do is not to endure four years of a Pittsburgh winter. The hardest thing you'll ever do is move. Walking on two feet upright is incredibly difficult. Doing this, this is an incredibly complex task. Doing it with your eyes closed is insanely complex. This is why policemen will use this test to see if you've been drinking, because it is one of the skills, the first skills that you lose when you're mildly impaired. We know it's hard because it takes us forever to get any good at it. The girl in the pink stripes there is my daughter. She's 19 months old, and she's the light of my life. But I will be honest with you, for the first six months of her life, from a motor control perspective, completely useless. <laughs> All she could do is flail. If you give an infant a pile of Cheerios, they will gleefully take those Cheerios and scoop them up and drop them on the ground for the dog to eat and scoop them up. Occasionally, one will get into the mouth. And they'll do this for hours. And they'll do this for hours because it takes hours upon hours upon hours of practice to use these, the most complex tools we've ever had to use. We know motor control is hard because we will pay millions of dollars to those of us who do it marginally better than others of us for the sheer joy of watching them perform. <laughs> and finally, we know motor control is hard because you devote more neural real estate to the problem of motor control than you do to most anything else. In addition to primary motor cortex, which as the name implies, ought to be the area that controls, sends direct control over muscles, there are at last count six other cortical areas, all of which send projections down the spinal cord to exert direct control over your muscles. Subcortically, we have loops from the thalamus and the basal ganglia, which you may have heard of from Parkinson's disease, that all engage in the process of motor control. And the cerebellum, which is this fist-sized structure that sits in the back of your head, it has more neurons in it than the rest of the brain combined, and the primary role of the cerebellum is to solve motor control problems. You may ask yourself, why is motor control so hard? And the reason is because we're made out of meat. Computers have silicon and gold wires, and they can shuttle electrical pulses around at about half the speed of light. It takes a visual stimulus from the time it hits our retina until the time it can act on motor control centers, about a tenth of a second. Now, a tenth of a second may not seem very long, but a tenth of a second is time for a well-struck tennis ball to travel a good eight feet. A tenth of a second is the difference between being an apex predator and being lion food. A tenth of a second is an age in motor control. So to overcome the burden of working with a pile of meat, we have to learn. So the way we control, we compensate for these sensory motor delays is we practice. As we pick up these Cheerios, what we're doing is we're building a conceptual internal model of our hand. We're predicting how our hand is going to respond to those motor control pulses and predicting where it's going to end up in real time so that we can use that information to make new motor control decisions. Now these internal representations of our limbs have to be continually updated as we age, as we get injured, as we fatigue. Every time we pick up a new object, we need a new model so that we can perform dexterous motor control with that. And the biggest trick your brain ever played on you was in convincing you that motor control is easy. We don't even think about motor control until it goes wrong. Spinal cord injury affects roughly 300,000 people in the United States, roughly 12,000 new cases per year. The median age of spinal cord injury is about 40. This represents a tremendous burden on our healthcare system. In addition to spinal cord injury, other motor control disorders like Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, amputation, brainstem stroke, Parkinson's disease. All of these represent disorders of motor control where people can no longer move in the way that they used to move. In the majority of these cases, the cortical representation of movement is intact. The problem represents a communication with the muscles. For whatever reason, we can't communicate with the muscles. 
My research involves trying to fix this. This is a video from colleagues of mine in the Schwartz lab. This is Jan. Jan was roughly 30 when she suffered from a rare spinal cerebellar disorder, uh, disorder, which caused her to lose the ability to control all four of her limbs. Jan has two electrode recording arrays implanted into the motor control centers of her brain. And we're using these control signals to control this, she's using these, these electrodes to control this robotic arm and move it around and feed herself chocolate for the first time in 10 years. And what you may not know about brain machine interfaces is that learning is absolutely key to their success. And also, learning appears to be one of the reasons why they don't look better. The way these devices work is we record signals directly from the motor control areas of the brain. We tap out the electrical impulses, and we use those to directly actuate a device. In my case, it's typically cursors on computer screens. And I watch as subjects attempt to control their neural activity to make that cursor do what they want, hit, hit targets, get rewards. Brain-computer interfaces represent a tremendous tool for studying motor learning because we know exactly how they work. We've engineered them. We don't know how hands work. We didn't engineer those. But because we know how these work, we can watch as subjects work to try and get control of them and build internal conceptualizations of these devices. It turns out subjects who use brain-computer interfaces can engage most of the natural motor learning processes that we engage. Most, not all. And we're studying this process to try and understand the development of these internal models, where they might go wrong, how we might be able to develop them better. As they struggle with a cursor and are continually updating those internal models, we're trying to refine how we send feedback to these subjects so that they can learn faster. We're trying to push the fundamental capacities of our brain. How much can we learn in a chunk of neural tissue? And how do we learn it? Our research endeavors, I consider them to be sort of uniquely CMU. We, take, we combine techniques from machine learning, computer science, engineering, and we combine them with neuroscience and psychology, biology. And Carnegie Mellon has been tremendously supportive in this endeavor, bringing it all under one roof, under the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition and Brain Hub, and putting it all together. Thank you very much for your attention.